Guys, two videos within just over a week. Right now I'm different. And since my last video, I have been grinding in the laboratory, the kitchen, so to speak, cooking up this Michelin star build. And I think I've managed to put something together that is fun to play, powerful, and very different from the standard run of the mill meta builds that has been kind of the trend even on this channel. So no more divine smiting, no more ballas armor. Today I present you the Shadow Monk. This idea was first suggested to me by commenter The Missing 8 some time ago. So shout out to you for the suggestion and for being a regular supporter on my channel. So with that suggestion brewing in the back of my mind, I wanted to make a build that makes use of one of the coolest items in the game in the Resonance Stone, which emanates a psychic vulnerability aura doubling your psychic damage. So I thought about ways to build around the psychic vulnerability and put together this kind of Illithid Psionic Shadow Monk, which uses the super fun combination of the Shadow Blade weapon that you get in Act 2, and the Shadow Monk level 11 ability, Shadow Strike, for ridiculous amounts of psychic damage per hit. Just to give a rough ballpark, the Shadow Blade rolls 2d8 psychic, and Shadow Strike rolls 3d8 psychic, combining to 5d8 psychic damage, doubled by the Resonance Stone to 10d8 psychic damage per hit, and this is without considering ability modifiers, damage riders, and critical hits, which can easily take your per hit damage to upwards of 200. There is a lot of setup involved. For example, Shadow Strike requires you to be hidden or invisible to cast. So maximizing the potential of the build requires a lot of pre-buffing with things like greater invisibility, pass without trace, you know, casting darkness on clumps of enemies. And it can seem tedious to have to set up fights in a way that enables this build, but once you get the ball rolling and the build comes online, it's really been one of the most fun builds I've used. Shadow Step stands out as another highlight of the build, being this resources Missy Step, which is great for your mobility as a melee character. For those of you that have played any of the Dishonored games, this build feels like if Corvo were in Faerun. So yeah, onto the build. So, in terms of race, you're gonna want to go Astarian. You guys knew it was coming, right? But Ex Machina aside, first things first, I urge you guys to play the Dark Urge with this build, as the Deathstalker Mantle, which is the cape you get from playing the Dark Urge, is especially valuable to this build for a consistent way to satisfy the invisibility requirement of Shadow Strike, making it so that we can cast Shadow Strike after killing an enemy even if we don't use greater invisibility or aren't hiding. Which we won't always be able to do, and even if we can, there's always a chance that you fail the stealth check required to maintain greater invisibility, in which case the cape can compensate. Especially if you want to be able to cast multiple shadow strikes a turn without solely relying on greater invis, the Dark Urge cape is a must-have. Again, similar to my Gloomstalker guide, this will mean that my meta quote unquote suggestion is to play the Dark Urge, assign this build to Astarian, and give him the cape as well. In terms of custom races, you want to first just click off of Dragonborn to avoid accidentally playing this shit. We don't want our campaign to be over before it even begins. Once you've done that, feel free to choose between any of my generic melee recommendations in the Wood Elf, the Wood Half Elf, the Half Orc, and the Halfling. I also want to take a second to make a case for the Deep Gnome. The advantage to stealth checks will only matter in the early game, as the Resonance Stone provides advantage to all physical checks, which include stealth as well as shove and lockpicking and some others. But more importantly, gnomes get Gnome Cunning, which grants advantage on most mental saving throws, which the Resonance Stone makes you have a disadvantage on. So it's a built-in passive way to nullify the negative effect of the Resonance Stone, which you would otherwise have to accomplish with gear or some form of buff, be it elixir or spell. So consider playing the Deep Gnome as well. Leveling progression for this build is relatively simple because we have to take 11 levels of Monk to get to Shadow Strike. So there can only be so many options in terms of leveling decisions, but there is a case to be made for the inclusion of one level of Rogue for sneak attack for an extra 2d6 psychic damage. And even that one level of Rogue raises a question of when to include it. One thing is certain, as is always certain with leveling any martial build, 
regardless of whether or not you multi-class, you want to mono-class until at least level 5 to get our martial extra attack as soon as physically possible. Yes, it's that important. With this build specifically, I also want to get to monk level 8 as soon as physically possible for our second feat, which I'm going to discuss later. So the leveling progression will be to just take 8 levels of monk up front, and then you can think about adding rogue if you don't mind delaying shadow strike by one level. So at level 1 we start with monk. Your background will default to the haunted one if you're the dark urge, otherwise just pick whatever you'd like. This character makes a lousy face character as it doesn't benefit from charisma at all and probably shouldn't be the character to enter dialogue in your party. For our ability points, we're going to put our plus 2 bonus into dexterity for 17 dexterity. Dexterity is our most important stat by far. It determines our armor class as we're not going to be wearing heavy armor. It gives us initiative and our shadow blades will scale both in accuracy and damage with our dexterity score. We set it to 17, not because we're going to round it up with the hag's hair, but because we're going to be taking moderately armored as our second feat for medium armor proficiency that we don't get from monk or rogue, and that feat will add 1 point to our dexterity score, setting it to 18. If you want to give this character the hag's hair, you can maybe set its wisdom to 15 and round up the wisdom to 16, otherwise your stat spread is 17 dexterity, 16 constitution, 14 wisdom, and 10 in either strength, intelligence, or charisma. This will not be a tavern brawler build, so we don't care about our strength other than for carry weight and jump distance. At monk level 2, we get a really nice bonus to our movement speed if we're not wearing armor. The only time we'll even consider wearing armor is the latter half of Act 2 and Act 3, otherwise we're always benefiting from this bonus. We also get some nice bonus actions in disengage and dash. It sucks that it uses a key point, which we otherwise want to be using on our offensive abilities, but key points restore on short rest, so it's not the end of the world. At monk level 3, we get to choose our subclass, and I know you're thinking, you know, okay, here it comes, the way of the shadow. And although you're right, and I chose way of the shadow in my own campaign, I want to put a disclaimer here that in every way, shape, and form, it would be so much better to just use an open hand monk until at least act 2. Unfortunately, shadow monk is just quite weak without certain abilities and gear pieces like shadow strike, shadow blade, the eversight ring. These are critical ones that we don't get until act 2 is the earliest instance. And it's not only that shadow monk is weak in the early game, but that comparatively the open hand monk with you know strength elixirs and tavern brawler is just completely broken in the early game. Just to give an example of what I mean, you guys saw in the clips of how I create these choke points of darkness to gain advantage on all my attack rolls within it and incur disadvantage on all the enemies attack rolls within it. The issue is that the dark vision you get from the shadow monk subclass doesn't work inside magical darkness, which just so happens to be the type of darkness that you also get from the shadow monk subclass. Again, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to level assuming that you're playing a shadow monk starting level one but my actual recommendation would be to play an open hand monk until you get specifically the shadow blade and the eversight ring in act two. And I'll go over that in my gearing section, but for now we'll just stick with it. So way of the shadow at monk level three. At monk level four, we get access to our first feat. This build gets two feats if you include the one level of rogue and three feats if you don't. The two feats we'll always take regardless are going to be savage attacker and moderately armored, with the third feat being between alert and ability improvement for a plus two to our dexterity. Since there are actually a lot of great gear pieces in act one that aren't considered armor, we're in no rush to take moderately armored for the medium armor proficiency. So at level four, we're just gonna take savage attacker for a passive way to optimize our melee damage. At monk level 5, we get our coveted martial extra attack, now being able to attack twice with one action and once with your bonus action. We also get our stunning strike, which is going to be your go-to key spender ability. One key point for a chance to stun the enemy and make them skip their turn is really strong action economy. At monk level 6, we get even more movement speed if we're not wearing armor, which is always great, but we finally get our shadow step. 
Shadow Step is an even better Misty Step as it doesn't cost a resource, it doesn't cost a spell slot or a key point, and you get advantage on your next attack roll after Shadow Stepping. So Shadow Step now becomes our go-to use for our bonus action. It's even worth using Shadow Step on an enemy that you're already right next to or in front of as a way of just getting advantage for a bonus action, which again is really strong action economy. At Monk level 7, we get some really nice passive defenses. Evasion allows us to use our dexterity to make a saving throw against AoE spells like Lightning Bolt or Fireball. In the case that we pass a saving throw, which we're likely to do because our dexterity is so high, we take no damage from it, and if we fail, we only take half damage from it. We also get Stillness of Mind, which automatically allows us to remove a Charmed or Frightened condition. At Monk level 8, we finally get our second feat. At level 8, you're probably going to be in Act 2, in which case now there are medium armor pieces that we want to consider wearing, but since we don't have medium armor proficiency, as I mentioned before, we're going to choose moderately armored and put the plus 1 in our dexterity, rounding our dexterity modifier up to a plus 4, and gaining medium armor proficiency for the gear pieces that we'll need that I'll go over in the gearing section. From Monk level 9 until Monk level 11, there aren't any abilities that are all too important to get from Monk, so it provides a good window of opportunity to introduce Rogue into your build for sneak attack. In which case, I'd actually recommend going and respecking to start with your first level into Rogue and then taking 8 levels into Shadow Monk, as a Rogue start gives you extra proficiencies. The optimal way to go around it is actually probably to take Rogue now, you know, start Rogue at level 1, then take 8 levels of Shadow Monk, and then respec at total level 11 back into 11 levels of Shadow Monk as to not delay your Shadow Strike. But again, just for the purposes of this video, I'll keep leveling as a Shadow Monk. So this is what I was talking about. At Monk level 10, we get some immunity to poison. Great, no one does any poison damage in this game, and some unarmored movement speed, which is fine, but at this point we're using Shadow Step to move around. At our most exciting level, Monk level 11, we finally get our Shadow Strike. At this point, I'd consider the build to be fully online, as now you're in Act 3, you have the Resonance Stone, you have all the abilities you need, and access to all the gear pieces necessary to duplicate the damage from the clips in my intro. Shadow Strike is why we take 11 levels into Monk. So before you comment that, you know, 3 Rogue would be better, or that Fighter would give me Action Surge, or God forbid you guys bring up War Cleric again, note that Shadow Strike is the reason I chose not to multi-class this build further. Is Shadow Strike that important, as in to make or break the integrity of the build? Not necessarily, and you can probably get a bonus to your damage that's equivalent to Shadow Strike from certain multi-class benefits like Action Surge or another bonus action from Thief. But for the flavor and the fun of this build, I wanted to take 11 levels into Monk, and I wanted to have Shadow Strike. And finally, level 12, as aforementioned, you can either introduce the one level of Rogue into your build for sneak attack, which would normally add 1d6 psychic damage to your attack, but which is doubled to 2d6 psychic damage by the Resonance Stone. Adding Rogue is the damage-oriented choice, but if you feel that you have enough damage in your team, or with this build specifically, you can choose to either take Alert for initiative, or Ability Improvement to round your dexterity to 20. There is a caveat to the Shadow Blade that we want to work around. The Shadow Blade can only be obtained by the Shadow Ring in Act 2, which is a quest reward for telling Arabella that her parents are deceased. The Ring gives you the ability to spawn a Shadow Blade, but it both requires concentration and can only spawn one Shadow Blade. This would mean that to wield the Shadow Blade, we have to occupy a ring slot that essentially does nothing, because if we take off the Shadow Ring even after spawning the blade, it despawns. It also occupies our concentration slot, which is really bad. Getting unlucky and breaking concentration would mean losing the weapon until short rest, and it means being unable to concentrate on way more important spells for this build specifically, such as Pass Without Trace, Greater Invisibility, or Darkness. But we absolutely need the Shadow Blade, and we preferably want to dual wield two of them. They're the only light weapon in the game that exclusively deal psychic damage. Luckily, there is a workaround. Whether it's intended or not, I don't know, but there is a way to spawn Shadow Blades in a way that doesn't require concentration, 
it doesn't require you to wear the shadow ring, and it lasts forever. So to obtain two permanent copies of the shadow blade, upon getting the shadow ring in Act 2, go to camp, speak with Withers, ask about recruiting a hireling, recruit any of the hirelings, it doesn't matter, have them equip the shadow ring and spawn in the shadow blade, While the hireling still has the blade and the ring equipped, speak to them and dismiss them back to the feud plane. Once you talk to Withers again and hire that exact same hireling, they'll come back equipped with a permanent copy of the Shadow Blade that you can yoink from their inventory, and if you repeat the process, you'll have two of them. This way we can carry two Shadow Blades without needing to have the ring equipped or concentrated on. While on the topic of the Shadow Blades, you should also address the issue of the Shadow Blades not being magical weapons. Magical weapons usually have a weapon enchant that adds anywhere from 1 to 3 points into your attack roll calculation, which can help significantly with your accuracy. You may find that accuracy is legitimately a problem with these weapons if you're not attacking with advantage, and sometimes even with advantage. The best workaround, in my opinion, is going to be to use the Drake Throat Glaive that you can buy from Royal Moonglow and Moonrise Towers to apply both a plus one enchant and 1d4 elemental damage to one of your shadow blades, both if you get a sorcerer to twin cast the ability, and for the other shadow blade, having a party member that usually doesn't concentrate on spells, so for example I'm using a Starion who's on my Gloomstalker, to concentrate on a scroll of magic weapon. Next is the matter of shadow striking, specifically the ability to shadow strike multiple times a turn. First things first, until you get to shadow strike, your game plan revolves around clumping the enemies as close together as possible, casting darkness on all of them, and using the Eversight ring which you get in Act 2 to create this literal like domain expansion where you have advantage on all of your attack rolls and your enemies have disadvantage on all of their attack rolls. That is the crux of the build until you can get the shadow strike. You carry the Resonance Stone, you're constantly in or around darkness, and you go crazy with things like the Bloodlust Elixir and the Death Stalker Mantle to be this general nuisance to deal with. Once you get Shadow Strike, you'll want to slightly change the way you approach certain fights. Remember that Shadow Strike can only be cast when hiding or invisible, which is a steep requirement considering how difficult it can be to do either of those things in combat. So in the instances that you want to Shadow Strike multiple times a turn, such as for boss fights, your setup will involve having a party member with bonuses to their saving throws concentrate on greater invisibility cast on you. In my campaign, I had Shadowheart on a Tempest Cleric slash Evocation Wizard with 20 intelligence casted on me, as she had a ton of bonuses to her intelligence saving throws and was not at a significant risk of having her concentration broken. After casting Greater Invisibility, you, the monk, want to cast and concentrate on Pass Without Trace instead of Darkness. Pass Without Trace will add a flat plus 10 to all your stealth checks, which is important because Greater Invisibility rolls a stealth check every time you make an attack or take an action while invisible to maintain that invisibility. Pair this plus 10 from Pass Without Trace with the fact that the Resonance Stone allows you to roll your stealth checks with advantage. The only time I've ever lost Greater Invisibility in my entire playthrough was because the spell just ends after 10 turns. So with this combination of Greater Invisibility and Pass Without Trace, you'll enter combat, as in turn-based combat, but will essentially permanently be invisible for the entire duration of the fight and therefore be able to cast as many shadow strikes as you have key points. Oh and by the way, just a quick little tidbit, I found out just this playthrough that there's this thing called Terra Zul that the bartender sells in the guild hall in Act 3, which is, it gives you the same effect of a, uh, you know, haste, but it stacks with haste, so go stock up on Terra Zul. For elliptic powers, I recommend taking all of them. 
I'm kind of joking, but I'm also kind of not. If we look past the generic choices of, you know, the favorable beginnings, the luck of the far realms, the psionic backlashes, the call of the weeks, having psychic vulnerability on your build enables a few new illithid powers that I've never used before. Mind Blast suddenly becomes this huge AoE ability that does more damage than Fireball with the possibility to stun your target. If you also make the monk undergo the Zaythisk in the crash, you also get to cast Mind Blast as a bonus action. Literally a better Fireball as a bonus action, which can also stun, is just nuts. Psionic Overload becomes 2d8 psychic damage on every attack for a bonus action. This place deals 2d8 psychic falling damage. Even the regular stuff like Psionic Backlash suddenly becomes Psionic Backshots. Shield of Thralls makes a lot of sense as a melee character. Ability Drain is great as we're attacking with Dexterity and therefore reducing the enemy's armor class by 1 unless they're wearing heavy armor. I could keep going, but it's just kind of the flavor of this build to be this kind of half illithid. so my genuine recommendation is to take any and all that seem relevant. All right, on to the gearing section. As always, if you're new to my videos, I split the gearing section by act, where I'm wearing what I think is the best available combination of gear in that act, with alternatives in my inventory that take into account some of the earlier and easier gear pieces to get in that act until you get the gear that I'm wearing, or that you can swap out interchangeably if you see fit. This build, but monks as a greater whole in general, are very flexible in terms of how they fit into your party, as the gear they want is usually uncontested by other party members, so let's get into it. In the first act, we don't have any armor proficiency, but can still put together a nice build for damage and armor class with the following pieces. The Diadem of Arcane Synergy, dropped by one of the Gith in the Inquisitor Wargas fight, which adds your Wisdom modifier to your weapon damage. The only cape available in Act 1 that also happens to be the best cape for this build, in the Deathstalker Mantle that you get by playing the Dark Urge. The Graceful Cloth sold by Lady Esther in the Mountain Pass, which will set our dexterity to 19 in Act 1, increasing both our armor class and dexterity modifier for attack rolls. The Bracers of Defense, which you can get from this chest inside the laboratory where the Necromancy of Fae book is in the Blighted Village for a plus two bonus to our armor class. The Disintegrating Nightwalkers dropped by Nier in Grimforge so that we're unimpeded by difficult terrain and for a free Misty Step. The Sentient Amulet, which you can also get from Grimforge for some extra key points per short rest, as well as a free Shatter per short rest great for dealing with those scrying eyes. The Caustic Band sold by Dareth Bonecloak in the Mykonic Colony. Reliable, consistent, just extra damage on your weapon attacks. Crusher's Ring dropped by Crusher in the Goblin Camp. Great for movement and moving around the battlefield in combat. For weapon, I'm only using the Knife of the Undermountain King. It comes with a lot of good benefits. Weapon Enchant plus two. Shadow Blade will usually proc because we're gonna be obscured because of darkness. Organ Rearranger is critical hit reduction. It looks strange to just use one light weapon, but because we don't have the two weapon fighting style, our unarmed attack is better used for our bonus action, as it'll deal more damage being that it does have our dexterity modifier added onto its damage. Until you get the Knife of the Undermountain King, I'd recommend just using Corellan's Grace sold by Auntie Ethel, and leaning a lot more into the unarmed playstyle with your you know, bonus action unarmed strike and flurry of blows. And then for bow, I just have the bow of awareness sold by Roa Moonglow in the goblin camp for a plus one to our initiative. For alternatives, we have the haste helm that you can find in the blighted village for extra movement speed. The warped headband of intellect dropped by the elegant ogre in the blighted village in case you're using scrolls with this character. Any non-armor armor pieces such as the protect the sparks wall from Grimforge or the robe of summer from the hidden vault in the druid's grove. The Gloves of the Growling Underdog from the Treasury Room behind Drawer Ragslin. Always a decent choice for melee characters, but not worth losing out on the plus two AC from the Bracers of Defense. The Strange Conduit Ring from a chest in Inquisitor Wargaz's room. This ring will be very important later on, so it's good to have it now. The Ring of Protection, which is a quest reward from Mole for stealing the Druid Idol, bringing our AC up to a respectable amount, considering we aren't wearing any armor. In Act 2, as I'm sure you can tell, we almost entirely change our setup to now accommodate the fact that we're going to be casting Darkness offensively and reliably having advantage on our attack rolls, as well as dual wielding our Shadow Blades. For our helmet, we have the Dark Justice Seer helmet from the Gaunt of Lifshar. We're practically always going to be obscured by Darkness, so any while obscured effect is extremely valuable to us. We keep the Death Soccer mantle. For your armor, you could keep wearing the Graceful Cloth for damage and accuracy, 
AC is not that important as enemies should consistently have disadvantage on their attack rolls being that they're in darkness. But if you find that it is becoming a problem, Act 2 is when we get our second feat in Moderately Armored, therefore granting us medium armor proficiency. In which case you can wear, for example, the Yuanti Scale Mail sold by Quartermaster Tali at Last Light Inn. For gloves, we have the flawed Helldusk gloves crafted by Damon at Last Light Inn for some extra damage output. Our boots are the Evasive Shoes sold by Mattis at Last Light Inn for even more armor class, especially if you're going to keep wearing the Graceful Cloth. Our amulet remains to be the Sentient Amulet. One of our rings has to become the Eversight Ring from the House of Healing Morgue. This ring is the only reason we're able to enter our darkness and not be affected by the blinded condition. And then for our other ring, we're almost always going to be concentrating on darkness, so we go with the Strange Conduit ring to passively deal 2d8 psychic damage with the Resonance Stone as a result. Our weapons are going to be the dual shadow blades, see the permanent shadow blade section earlier in the video if you skip the head, and our bow remains to be the bow of awareness just for initiative. Some alternatives include continuing to wear the diadem, the extra damage is still not bad in act 2, the covert cowl dropped by the mean locks below last light in until you get the dark justice your helm, it's essentially the same thing anyway. The Fistbreaker Helm sold by Lan Tarb in Moonrise Towers for even more initiative. Again, this build's AC can become quite low, so if you either aren't Dark Urge and can't get to that Stalker Mantle, or you just find that you're getting hit too often, you can wear the Cloak of Protection sold by Quartermaster Tali at Last Light Inn for even more AC. The Gloves of Balanced Hands sold by Quartermaster Tali again. These gloves are actually interesting to think about as they do give us that two weapon fighting style I mentioned not having earlier which would add, at this point, our plus 5 dexterity bonus to our offhand attack. Just for that reason, they may even be on par with the flawed Helldust gloves. The Dark Justicier gloves from the room below your gear, in case someone else in your party is using the flawed Helldust gloves. There is like a variation of this build that's less committed to the whole psychic damage thing and, and more balanced out with piercing damage, that then would wear like the Ballas armor in Act 3 and wield, for example, the Knife of the Undermountain King and maybe the render of mind and body. But I've done so many ballas builds, so I'll present the alternative to you guys, but also know that the build would be different. If you focus more on piercing damage, you don't care so much about the psychic damage, and therefore don't care to take 11 levels of Shadow Monk for Shadow Strike. For rings, you'll obviously need to obtain the Shadow Blade ring, which is a quest reward from Arabella's quest line in Act 2. You could also occasionally use the Killer Sweetheart dropped in the Self Same Trial in the Gauntlet of Shar for an extra critical hit. And of course, whatever you do, do not forget to pick up the Resonance Stone from the Mykonid Colony in Act 2 before you fight Kethric Thorn. This item may as well be the entire build. There are so many permutations of gear combinations in Act 3 that it's difficult to present just one. So take what I'm wearing with a grain of salt and know that for this section, the alternatives are legitimately at least as good as what I'm wearing on my character. Lots of avenues are now open to us and your gearing will also change depending on your playstyle. For example, in Act 3, I almost entirely stopped using the darkness shenanigans and utilized the greater invisibility Pass Without Trace and Shadow Strikes a lot more, which took a lot of the blind immunity emphasis off of the build and my gearing. I'll just try my best to explain what each gear piece would accommodate in terms of playstyle, and you can make decisions based on your playstyle from there. For a helmet, I have Saravok's Helm, dropped by Saravok Anchev for crit reduction and CC immunity. I continue to use the Deathstalker Mantle, I think even in Act 3, it's the most flexible cape in its applications. For armor, I swear you could get away with continuing to wear the Graceful Cloth for what is essentially an ability improvement to your dexterity. But again, if you feel that your AC is causing issues, then you can switch to the Armor of Agility sold by Gloomy Fentinson in the Lower City. For gloves, I have the Helldusk Gloves dropped by Harlip in the House of Hope for the 1d6 fire damage, which I believe is rerolled for by Savage Attacker to optimize it. For boots, I have the Helldusk boots, which are in a container in the top floor of Worms Rock Fortress. The Steadfast effect is really nice, especially if you continue to use Darkness, it becomes impossible to get you out of it. For our amulet, I continue to use the Sentient Amulet. Remember to deny the curse from Shira 
Otherwise, you're going to lose the amulet and gain Tasha's hideous laughter, which, I mean, it's poop. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I stray away from the darkness stuff in Act 3, so I stopped using the Eversight ring and instead switched to the Caustic Band and Strange Conduit ring. Your weapons are still going to be the Shadow Blades and the Deadshot Bow for even more crit reduction. On to the many alternatives. First, we have the Helmet of Grit, dropped by the Diseased Girl in Cazador's place for an extra bonus action. An extra bonus action can mean a Mind Blast, Psionic Overload, it can mean an extra offhand attack. Our bonus actions are actually quite valuable, so this helmet becomes a front runner. The Helldusk helmet from the Vault in the House of Hope that you can use instead of the Eversight Ring if you are going to continue to use Darkness. The Face Semblance Amulet from the Hag Quest line, which will offset the disadvantage that the Resonant Stone sets on your mental saving throws. The Amulet of Greater Health from the House of Hope as a just generally strong item. The Shade Slayer Cloak sold by Sticky Dondo from the Guildhall. But it sounds better than it is because being invisible doesn't mean hiding, so you literally have to be crouched in sneak for this effect to proc, which is difficult and costly to do multiple times in combat. It's a lot easier to do out of combat. You can keep wearing the Cloak of Protection, Dark Justice Here Half Plate, Graceful Cloth, or even Evasive Shoes. The Legacy of the Masters sold by Damon in the Lower City are also really strong, specifically for their plus two bonus to your attack rolls. Even in Act 3, this build can struggle with accuracy without advantage. If you want to keep using Darkness but aren't using the Helldusk helmet, you can keep wearing the Eversight ring. Otherwise, just occasionally switch it out for the Killer Sweetheart. Finally, up here I have this kind of mock setup of what the Ballas variation would look like. But again, in the case that you want to do a Ballas Shadow Monk, I'd probably recommend a deeper multi-class. Something like Monk, Rogue, Fighter, maybe Monk, Rogue, Warlock, something else, right? You don't need 11 levels of Monk if you're going to do piercing damage. 